Hello everybody, this is Dr. Christopher White and welcome back for part 2 of Mesozoic Life History, part 2. So, now we're going to move on to Mesozoic marine reptiles. So, we know that several types of reptiles in the Mesozoic adapted to the marine environment. So, we know there were saltwater crocodiles, we know there were turtles, and we also know that marine reptiles have made it through to the present day. So, we have marine reptiles like sea snakes and marine iguanas. So, you know, reptiles moving into the marine environment isn't anything, you know, out of the ordinary. Now, in the Mesozoic in particular, we do see the evolution of three very large apex marine predators that were reptiles. And these groups are the ichthyosaurs, the plesiosaurs, and the mosasaurs. So the ichthyosaurs are the first group we're going to look at here, and you can actually see a picture of an ichthyosaur back there. So ichthyosaurs varied in length from about 0.7 meters to 15 meters long, and they had a body morphology similar to a shark. So they have this very elongate, streamlined body, obviously a tail for propulsion, fins for steering, and obviously a mouth absolutely stuffed with teeth for grabbing food. One of the things we notice about ichthyosaurs is they do have extremely large eyes, and this would suggest that they were probably functioning in quite low light conditions, which would suggest they probably dived quite deep into the, into the ocean, essentially into areas of water which would have very little light, and they were probably hunting for cephalopods, so squid and octopus, that kind of thing. So the, uh, the early stages of ichthyosaur evolution are relatively uncertain. Now, however, there is one species, Eutosaurus, and that does seem to fill the gap to some degree. And if we just look here, we can see we have the, the forelimbs and the hindlimbs have adapted to form flippers. We can begin to see we've got the elongation of the skull. And we can see that we also have the formation of a tail. So we can see this is the, the reptilian tail, but we can see the, the start of the formation of the upper fluke of the tail right there. So this is essentially the early stages of ichthyosaur evolution. This is obviously a more advanced ichthyosaur right here. So the ichthyosaurs use their tail for momentum and their fins for steering, just like a modern day shark. From what we can see from their stomach contents, their diet consisted primarily of fish and cephalopods. And because ichthyosaurs could not leave the water to lay their eggs, uh, it's very likely that ichthyosaurs actually retained the embryo inside their body and gave birth to live young. And this is supported by fossil evidence. So the next group we're interested in are the plesiosaurs. So the plesiosaurs have two subgroups, the long-necked plesiosaurs and the short-necked plesiosaurs. Now, we don't know why the neck length varied between these two groups. So both of these groups were nectonic, so they were swimming around in the open water, so that, you know, there's no reason, you know, there, there's no different habitat involved. And they both had very similar diets. So the, sh the long necked and the short necked plesiosaurs would be eating approximately the same thing. And so this doesn't actually help to explain why the long necked variety developed the long neck, because if they were living in some kind of different environment, that might explain why they developed long neck. If they were trying to exploit, you know, a, a different food source, that might also explain why they developed the long neck. But neither of those two points, you know, it actually holds true. And so we're not really sure what the mechanism is that's driving the formation of this long neck. Now, when we look at the short-necked uh, plesiosaurs, one of the things we do notice, though, is that on the whole, their build appears to be stockiest. So they're, they're more heavily built. And this would suggest that the shorter-necked plesiosaurs may well have been designed for hunting larger, tougher prey. So it may well be that the short neck, the long neck plesiosaur, sorry, with their with their more uh, refined uh, spinal column and long neck, may well have been better sorted for hunting small prey like fish, whereas the short neck plesiosaurs, being naturally a bit more stocky, might have been better better suited for sort uh, for hunting uh, larger, tougher prey items. So that is a possibility, but on the whole, there's no conclusive piece of evidence that definitively says, right, this is why they had long necks, and this is why they didn't have long necks. 
Now, most plesiosaurs were relatively modest in size, about three and a half to six meters, although one specimen did make it up to 15 meters. So the diet of plesiosaurs consists mostly of fish, cephalopods, and marine invertebrates. So we can see shell, uh, we can see fragments of mollusk shell, and we can see fragments of echinoderm shell within the stomach contents of plesiosaurs. Now, some plesiosaurs were large enough, and so a great example of this is the uh, plesiosaur Chronosaurus, uh, that they may have been capable of hunting smaller plesiosaurs. So in those instances, you know, the, the size of the animal and uh, the design of the animal would suggest that they were designed for hunting other plesiosaurs. And the stomach contents we have for these larger uh, plesiosaurs like Chronosaurus would suggest that they were hunting other smaller plesiosaurs. Now, like the ichthyosaurs, the plesiosaurs gave birth to live young with one example containing a fossilized fetus. So here we go. So if you just get rid of the text, you can see a picture of a couple of these long necked plesiosaurs. So we obviously we have the forelimbs and the, the hind limbs here, which are forming fins now. And of course, they can be used for both propulsion and steering. And we have a broad tail at the back, which can also, of course, be used for propulsion. So in terms of ichthyosaur reproduction, we just discussed how they appear to have given birth to live young. And if we look at this particular example at the top here, you can actually see here's the ichthyosaur skeleton. And right there, you can see a embryonic ichthyosaur. And so there's a couple of ways we can interpret this skeleton. The first interpretation is that the mother ichthyosaur went and died, giving birth to the uh, juvenile ichthyosaur right here. Or there is the possibility that the uh, the mother ichthyosaur went and died and the fetus was forced out of the body as the body cavity began to fill up with gases through to, uh, due to decomposition. Now, in terms of uh, ichthyosaur fetuses inside the skeleton, uh, there was one particularly there's one particular form of early ichthyosaur that was found in China in 1974. And this is very, very important because in 2014, this, you know, three specimens of this ichthyosaur were identified to contain embryos. Now, when we look at the embryos themselves, we see a couple of things which are quite important. So the embryo position is located here at the base of the spine towards the bottom of the rib cage. We also note that the embryos that we, we see do not show tooth marks and they don't show any acid damage. So obviously, if they showed tooth marks, that would suggest that they were a prey item. They'd been chewed on as they were essentially being attacked by the adult uh, ichthyosaur. The other thing is, of course, the acid damage would suggest that the body had passed through the digestive system, so through the stomach. However, because we don't have tooth marks and acid damage, that would suggest that these uh, small uh, ichthyosaurs sorry, were not prey items. So if we look here, we can see a beautiful example of an ichthyosaur containing fetuses. And there's actually three fetuses within this particular ichthyosaur. So here we have the spinal column coming through there like so. We have ribs here and we have one of the hind fins right here. Now, I'm actually just going to drop down to this image at the bottom because it shows the position of the embryos uh, more nicely. So we can see we have the first embryo marked out here in yellow. And if we look at the picture here, we can see right there's its skull there, and here's its torso right here. The second embryo is marked out here in orange, and it's mostly a skull, and we can see that skull right there. The final embryo doesn't have a skull, but we can see parts of the torso. We can see them in these red dots here. And so once again, you can see these lines, these spinal columns here, show us there was also a third embryo in the womb. And so this would suggest that um, ichthyosaurs you know, had the capacity to have more than one embryo in their uterus at any one time. So in terms of the plesiosaurs, the specimen we're looking at is, is not quite as clear cut as the uh, ichthyosaur skeleton we were looking at a second ago. So here's our plesiosaur and we can see we have the two forelimbs here and the two hind limbs right here. We can see the spinal column coming down like so. We can see here's the pelvis. Well, there's one side of the pelvis there. There's the other side right here. We've got the shoulder blades located right here and the ribs are located right there. 
Now, once again, we find small plesiosaur bones associated with this adult plesiosaur. So if we look right here, you can see there is a collection of small bones. And there are also some small bones here in the body cavity as well. So when we look at these bones, once again, they don't show any, any teeth marks and they don't show any effects of having been digested by stomach acid. So once again, these bones don't appear to have been from a prey item. They are more than likely from an embryo. Now, when we actually uh, look at the embryo position, um, that seems a little bit strange because if we go back to the ichthyosaur for just a second, we can see that the essentially the embryos are located here at the base of the rib cage, sorry, uh, just below the spinal column. Now, luckily, if we look at this diagram here, you can actually see we have these darker brown patches here. These represent some of the embryo bones and they're going to be located up just about there at the base of the, underneath the spinal column at the base of the rib cage, pretty much where you would expect the uterus to have been located. Now, the disarticulation of the embryo is likely the result of the partial, uh, the partially decomposed embryo spilling out of the mother onto the seafloor. I'm sorry if that sounds a bit gross, but I'm just trying to explain exactly what was going on. So obviously the, uh, the adult female plesiosaur will have died once again, the body cavity will have begun to fill up with gases due to um, decomposition, and that can eventually lead to the carcass rupturing. And it's possible that when this when this rupturing happened, the uterus went and ruptured, ruptured and the essentially the embryo, or more accurately, the embryo's uh, skeleton spilled out onto the seafloor. And so that's probably what we're looking at in this situation. But once again, this is good evidence to show that the plesiosaurs, like the ichthyosaurs, gave birth to live young. So there's a, there's a bit of a niche left by the extinction of the ichthyosaurs in the middle Cretaceous and the decline of the plesiosaurs throughout the Cretaceous. So as we're moving into the Cretaceous, the ichthyosaurs and the plesiosaurs are on the way out. And so this means that there is now an opening for a new apex marine predator. And so this opening in the marine environment is filled by the mosasaurs. So mosasaurs are related to modern day monitor lizards and they varied in size from about 2.5 meters to nine meters in length. So if we just get rid of the text here, you can see what we're talking about. So if you look at it, you can think to yourself, yes, I can kind of see the, the relationship to monitor lizards, but you can see that the forelimbs and the hind limbs are adapting to produce fins. And we can see that the tail here is becoming broader and flatter so that it can be used for propulsion in the water. So the fossilized stomach contents of mosasaurs showed they ate fish, birds, cephalopods, and smaller mosasaurs. So they did, you know, they, they were cannibals. One mosasaur example was also found to contain four embryos, once again suggesting that they gave birth to live young. Okay, so now we're going to move on to the birds. So as more and more feathered dinosaurs are discovered, the boundary between the dinosaurs and the birds has actually become more complex. So as we get more data, it's actually a bit more difficult to work out where the dinosaurs stop and the birds begin. So although birds do not resemble dinosaurs, all the evidence we have suggests that they evolved from a group of small theropods. So key similarities between birds and dinosaurs are that birds lay amniote eggs, just like dinosaurs, and there are similarities in the way that the jaws of birds and dinosaurs join to the skull. So if we look here, we can see here we have a uh, essentially a sketch diagram of a reptilian jaw, and we down here we have a generalized avian jaw, so bird jaw. And you'll notice that yes, the bones are different sizes, but the same bones are present in both jaws, and that's a strong indicator that these animals may well be related to each other. Now, in 1860, a fossilized bird named Archaeopteryx was found in Germany. So it had several bird-like features, but the, the two ones that really stood out were the fact that its body is covered in feathers, 
and it has a fused clavicle, which we would often refer to as a wishbone. So here is the Archaeopteryx fossil. So you can see that we can you can see that uh, this, the feathers are located here. You can see the wing feathers there, the tail feathers here. Now there were also leg feathers present in the fossil, but they were actually destroyed as part of the process of trying to uncover the tail bones behind. So unfortunately, those parts of the fossil have been lost. Now, as you can see, it does have these bird-like features. However, it also has teeth. It has claws on its wings, and it has a tail that consists of vertebrae. Okay, these are features which are related to the theropod dinosaurs. And so it looks like what you have here is an intermediate species between theropod dinosaurs and birds. Now, it was classified as a bird, and it was thought to represent the intermediate species that showed that the birds evolved from the dinosaurs. Now, there are those who oppose calling Archaeopteryx a bird, and they point out that fused wishbones and feathers are no longer exclusive to the birds, because we've begun to find more and more examples of dinosaurs, especially theropods, which were covered in feathers. And we also have a few examples of dinosaurs that had fused clavicles. Furthermore, Archaeopteryx is from the late Jurassic, but the theropod group of dinosaurs from which they're likely descended didn't really take off in a big way until the Cretaceous. And so that's a bit of a problem. If I'm sitting here saying to you, well, the birds clearly evolved from the theropods, but the theropods weren't around when these early bird-like dinosaurs were appearing, obviously we have a bit of a problem. However, we've managed to get around that issue. Uh, recently, a feathered theropod dinosaur has been found in late Jurassic rocks from China. And so this would suggest that we have these uh, late Jurassic feathered theropods. And so that gives us an, an indication that, yes, feathered theropod dinosaurs were present in the late Jurassic. And so it's probable that one of those feathered theropod dinosaurs would eventually end up giving rise to the birds. So now let's move on to the mammals. So during the late Carboniferous and into the Permian, we see the appearance of the Thrapsid reptiles. And this is a group of mammalian-like reptiles who evolve from the finned back reptiles, or the group that we refer to as the Plicosaurs. Now, among the Thrapsids, one group in particular, the Cynodonts, who appeared in the late Permian, were by far and away the most mammal-like. So the Cynodonts uh, make it through the Permian-Triassic mass extinction, and as they enter the Triassic, they diversify very, very quickly. So in terms of the Cynodonts themselves, they fall into two broad groups. There are the mammalian Cynodonts, who will eventually give rise to the mammals, and there are the non-mammalian Cynodonts, who are more reptilian. The non-mammalian Cynodonts die out and become extinct in the early Cretaceous, but as I said, the more mammalian Cynodonts persist and eventually they will give rise to the mammals. Now, typically it's relatively easy to classify an animal as a mammal. Mammals are warm-blooded, they have mammary glands, they give birth to live young, and they have hair slash fur. Now, the problem is, is that when you're working with a skeleton, well, these particular features typically aren't going to be visible in the fossil. And so we can't use them to identify animals as mammals. So instead, we need to look for other features that will allow us to identify a skeleton as belonging to a mammal or a mammalian-like creature. So the factors we look for are that mammals have a free boned inner ear. Reptiles, on the other hand, have an inner ear that consists of just one bone. There are also differences in the jawbone arrangement of reptiles and mammals. And the final feature we look for are differentiated teeth. So all mammals have incisors, canines, and molars. Now the number of each of these teeth that we have, or the shape of the teeth, will vary depending on what species you're looking at. So obviously a dog is going to have a completely different dental setup to a cow. However, both dogs and cows will have incisors, canines, and molars. 
So if we just get rid of the text here, here's a generalized picture of one of these cynodonts. And you can see that it does have very mammalian traits. So if we're talking about the differences between uh, reptiles and mammals, one of the main differences is in the ear design. So reptiles simply have a single bone that connects the eardrum to the inner ear. So that essentially transmits the sound. Now, in the case of the mammals, we actually have a three-boned inner ear that connects the eardrum to the inner ear. Now, the presence of these three bones is advantageous to mammals. It essentially makes our hearing better. It means that sounds are magnified. And so this obviously means that we have uh, essentially an evolutionary advantage. It means we can hear a predator trying to sneak up on us more easily. And it also means that if you are a predator, it means you can find prey more easily. And so the evolution of this free bone in ear is an advantage. Another thing that we look for are differences in the jaw design. So if we look here, we can see a general reptilian jaw. We can also see an avian, a bird jaw down here for comparison. You can see they are very similar in their design. They have the same bones in approximately the same locations, which would suggest they are relatively closely related to each other. Now, if we look at the mammal drawer over here, on the other hand, you'll see the situation is completely different. What you will notice is nearly the entire jaw is just one bone, the dentary. Compare that to the reptile jaw and the bird jaw, where you'll see the dentary only makes up approximately 50% of the jaw. If you look over here one more time, here's your mammal jaw, and you can see that it's about 80 to 90% dentary. So the jaw design is completely different. So during the reptile to mammal transition, we see the quadrate and articular bones, which are part of the reptilian jaw, are modified and they form the malleus and incus of the inner ear. So we see bones leaving the reptilian jaw. So here's the articular and quadrate bones located here at the back of the jaw. We see those become smaller, they move up into the skull, and they become part of the of the uh, the eardrum of the uh, well, the free boned inner ear should i say and so we can actually look in the fossil record and we can see the migration of these bones from the reptilian jaw into the ear canal so we can also see the articular uh, the articular bones of the cynodonts are noticeably smaller while the dentary makes up a larger percentage of the jaw. So although the cynodonts don't have a jaw that's dominated exclusively by the dentary, we can see that cynodonts did have jaws which were more dominated by the dentary when you compare them to other reptiles. And, sh and so this is showing you this position of the cynodonts as an intermediate species or intermediate group, shall I say, between the dinosaurs or between the reptiles sorry and the mammals so the transition that we can see between the reptiles and the mammals is pretty well documented in the fossil record however there are so many transitional forms between the reptiles and the mammals that it's actually a little bit difficult to work out where the reptiles end and where the mammals begin So the final feature that we were discussing were the differences in the teeth. So if we look here, we can see we have two skulls. This is a crocodile skull at the top and a ornithopod skull down here at the bottom. This is a hadrosaur, a duck-billed dinosaur. Now, what you'll notice is obviously, as discussed, they have mouths full of teeth. But the thing you'll notice is that although the size of the teeth does vary, the shape of the tooth, the way it's designed, is consistent so the tooth here at the front of your crocodile mouth is the same as the tooth here at the back the same goes for the hadrosaur you will notice that all of these teeth here are identical to each other now let's compare that to a cynodont skull well when we look at a cynodont skull we can quite clearly see that we have differentiated teeth so at the front here we have a, a number of small incisors then we have some lower canines here and some upper canines here. And then behind the canines, we have a bank of flat, broad teeth, which are going to be the molars.
And so we can see quite clearly that the cynodonts are essentially beginning to evolve the differentiated teeth, which are one of the strongest indicators of being a mammal. So can we see any other features that indicate that the cynodonts were the ancestors for modern mammals? Well, yes, there are actually a few other features that give us that indication. So the first thing that we can see are the changes in the tooth root design. So when we look at cynodont teeth, we see that they are becoming double rooted. And this means essentially there's at least two bone spurs that stick out of the bottom of the tooth and help to attach it to the jaw. And of course, this is a trait that's shared by most mammals. In the case of uh, groups of animals like reptiles, on the other hand, a lot of the teeth are single rooted. And so this means there's only one spur that's essentially anchoring that tooth into the jawbone. So we also see the appearance of specialized teeth, which we were discussing a second ago. In terms of the cynodonts, we see the appearance of incisors, canines, and molars, which are obviously a strong indicator of a mammalian link. Reptiles, on the other hand, do have variations in the size of the teeth in their mouth, but the tooth design itself is consistent. It doesn't change. There's no specialization of teeth in the mouth. Another thing that we notice is there's a change in the number of sets of teeth. So our current knowledge strongly suggests that like mammals, cynodonts only had two sets of teeth during their lifetime. In contrast, most reptiles have the capacity to replace damaged or lost teeth over time. Now, one of the other things that we see with the cynodonts is we see that they have the, an improved ability to pulp their food, to grind it in their mouths. So this is because we have the appearance of molars. So molars are big, broad, flat teeth which are specifically designed for pulping food. And obviously the more efficiently you can pulp your food, the finer the particle you can break it down to, and so the finer the particle, the more nutrients you can extract from that food. So this means that uh, the presence of these molars, these very specialized teeth, for pulping food and also a, a slight change in the in the jaw design helps to essentially make the uh, make mammal chewing more efficient when compared to the types of chewing that animals like reptiles like the dinosaurs are using so another change that we can see that hints at a link between the cynodonts and the mammals is what's called the on occipital condyle so in mammals, at the base of our skull, we have a bony lump that's called the occipital condyle. And essentially, this bony lump fits in to the first vertebrae of our spinal column. And it essentially keeps our head on top of our spinal column. Now, in the case of the reptiles, the occipital condyle is present, but it's a single lump of bone. In the case of the mammals, on the other hand, the occipital condyle consists of two lumps of bone. So when we look at the cynodonts, what we see is, yes, they still have a single occipital condyle. However, we can also begin to see that that occipital condyle is beginning to divide in two. So we can see the first stages of this transition between mammals and cynodonts. And if you look here, here's the base of a human skull. Here's the occipital condyle. There's one lump there, one lump there. And so these two bony lumps will essentially lock into the first vertebrae of the spinal column and help to keep the skull in place. And we, be we can begin to see the division of the occipital condyle essentially in the cynodonts, which shows that there's a, a good chance that they are related to the mammals. So the final two features that suggest a link between the cynodonts and the mammals are the secondary palate and the embryonic jaw development. So in terms of the secondary palate, it's part of the roof of your mouth. Now, the roof of your mouth consists of the primary palate, which is located directly behind your upper front teeth. And then behind that is your secondary palate. And in the case of mammals, the secondary palate is much larger than in other species. Now, the reason for having a larger secondary palate is that it helps to separate your nasal cavity from your mouth.
Now, this is important, especially for mammals, because it allows us to both eat and breathe at the same time. And of course, that's important because mammals are endothermic, so we're warm blooded. So obviously, we have a very high metabolism and therefore our body has a very strong need for a constant oxygen supply. And so this means if you stop breathing for a period of time so you can put food into your mouth and chew, well, that essentially increases the chance that you're going to pass out due to lack of oxygen. So in order to get around this, we have developed a, um, a solid roof to our mouths, and this allows us to keep our mouth separate from our nasal cavity so we can have food in our mouth and breathe through our nose at the same time. Now, in contrast, if we didn't have the secondary palate, what would happen is, is if we put too much food in our mouth, it would push up the roof of our mouth into our nasal cavity and if you were to push that you know the roof of your mouth far enough into the nasal cavity eventually it would block the nasal cavity and you wouldn't be able to breathe while you were eating and so having this solid secondary palate to, to, to form the roof of your mouth essentially helps to uh, you know separate the nasal cavity in the mouth and thereby allow us to breathe and eat at the same time now, as human fetuses develop in the womb, what we see is we see the secondary palate change from a more reptilian design to a more mammalian design. So we can see the secondary palate getting larger as the embryo develops in the uterus. So the final uh, feature which links uh, the synodonts to the mammals is a bit more general. And we're going back to the jaw design. So, as previously discussed, there are two bones in the reptile jaw that evolved to become part of the mammalian ear. So, when we look at embryonic jaw development for the mammals, what we see is that, ma is that mammal embryos possess a jaw that has quadrate and articular bones in it. Now, adult mammals do not have these bones in their jaw because they are actually part of the inner ear. However, the fact that embryos have them, at least in the early stages of their development, suggests a strong link between mammals and reptiles. Now, as the embryo develops in the womb, these two bones move from the jaw and they move inside the skull and they become part of the inner ear, where they form the incus and the malleus. So, once again, this is a clear indication that mammals evolve from reptiles. So if I just get rid of the text, we're going to bring up some diagrams. So what we can see is we can see we have six skulls here. So the skull on the top left is for a therapsid. So this is one of these reptiles with mammalian traits. And down here we can see a modern day dog skull. And what you can see is as we progress from more reptilian mammals to full-blown mammals, we can see the secondary palate, which is marked out here in green, is steadily getting larger and larger and larger until it helps to almost completely separate the roof, helps separate the mouth from the nasal cavity behind it. So having this larger secondary palate is essentially protecting the uh, nasal cavity inside the skull. Now, the other thing you'll notice is we have these bones here, marked out here in red in particular. So this is the quadrate bone, one of the two bones that will become part of the inner ear. And so when you look at the thrapsid here, you can see there are the quadrate bones. So that's part of the jaw of this uh, mammalian reptile. But then steadily, as we progress from essentially more reptilian to more mammalian, you will see the quadrate bones are getting smaller and smaller. And by the time you've made it to the modern dog, the quadrate bones have completely disappeared because they've been incorporated into the free boned inner ear, which all mammals possess. Okay, so this is a good place to stop part two. So stop the video, get up, have a walk around, go and get a glass of water, and then come back after having relaxed for five or 10 minutes for part three.